Good afternoon, Mr. Andrews. How are you? I'm well, thank you. All right, great. I, I, again, I really appreciate you know you taking part in uh, in this project. Welcome to the Chasing Skeptics uh, YouTube podcast. Mm -hmm. We are here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, it is raining, <laughs> but I am having an okay time. So. Um, we were speaking before, so you are from Oklahoma, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what is your story? Like, did you grow up with a religious family? Do you remember how you became an atheist? My mother and father were both uh, and remain fundamental Christians, uh, mm -hmm. fundamentalist religious people. Uh, they met at a uh, religious university. They speak the language of Christianity and Christ in the Bible, and they taught their children to do the same. We were uh, raised in... A private Christian school. We had Bible classes and Wednesday chapel services, which are like church for school. And um, we just never questioned. Of course there's a God. Of course the Bible is true. Of course Jesus died and rose again. Of course he's coming again and we're all going to heaven. Of course. And uh, I finally, through a series of, uh, you know, Two major things and a thousand small ones came to a point in my 30s when I gained the courage, gave myself permission rather, to start asking questions without accepting have faith as an answer. And uh, by the time I was, you know, end of 2008, I finally said out loud, I'm an atheist. I just don't believe it anymore. As Dale McGowan said, my desire to know became greater than my desire to believe. And so... I'm a non-believer. Oh, wow. Well, it's, it's, it's great to finally get to that point. As we spoke before, I had a little bit of kind of the journey, you know, like, is it okay to question? Um, could a God exist? I mean, have you ruled that out as a possibility? I've ruled out a benevolent God. A benevolent, all-powerful deity would have long since solved the God question, would have long since alleviated the innumerable instance innumerable instances of suffering on this planet is there a god-like creature out there you know drifting at the outer reaches of the universe who you know who knows uh, i don't believe in a deity because i have seen no evidence for it i'm essentially an atheist agnostic i i can't know that there isn't something somewhere but i don't believe because i've seen no evidence did you ever deal with, like, the fear of hell or the fear of punishment? Yeah, we were taught, uh, especially by my father, hell's a real place. And hell's a, a handy mechanism for the church and for religious cultures to keep people quiet. Uh, you don't want to go to hell, do you? And it's sad <laughs> that, that people carry the baggage of hell their whole lives. You know, I'm, I have doubts about all the stuff they taught me, but I don't want to go to hell. I want to live a truthful life, but I don't want to go to hell. Um, I don't want to burn forever. And of course, it stops us from asking questions. It stops us from challenging authority, from challenging established norms. I went through about 18 months where I knew it was illogical, it was unreasonable, but I still dealt with it. And my ticket out was to continue to explore the, the history of hell, the human invention of hell, Dante's version of hell, and how hell has been used by Christianity to quell challengers and and the morality of hell or the immorality, the fact that, you know, no loving deity would ever create such a sadistic torture chamber. It, it just can't exist. It doesn't exist. And being liberated from the threats of hell has, has been an amazing thing. It wasn't easy, but I got there. That's great. Yeah, a, lo a lot of atheists, um, they they have the same thing like where once they finally realize you know that it's liberating that they know that they're not that, that there's probably not some place um however most atheists believe obviously like when you die you know that's it everything shuts off and you're and you're dead but i like to ask this question where the possibility of there being that punishment like especially when we i, I like to bring up the example of db cooper and the zodiac killer people that committed a crime, be it a murder or whatever, and they never got caught. And if they die, they kind of got away with it. Like, does a part of you, would it be better if there was, maybe not a forever punishment, but would it be better if there was some type of punishment in the afterlife? The words for that are cosmic justice, and we hear this all the time. Do you want to live in a world where the evil aren't punished? 
do you really want to live in a world where you won't go to a happy place and be reunited with your religious family and your dog? And <laughs> your dog. Do you really want to live in a world? And, and I'm like, I always have to stop and say, well, what I want has nothing to do with what the evidence says. You know, uh, does an afterlife really constitute a fair form of cosmic justice anyway? Jeffrey Dahmer allegedly accept Jesus Christ in prison. So after he murdered and cannibalized and did these heinous crimes, he would now enjoy an eternity at the, at the foot of Jesus in his mansion in heaven, while people like Ayan Hirsi Ali, who fought for human rights all around the world, who's an atheist, will go burn forever in hell. So that's not even the kind of cosmic justice I would want. So I don't really lament that all that much. I, I, I think it does prompt us to try to make for a better world, a more just world today, because it's, there's no evidence that there's any other world coming after. It's interesting. When we talk about the future, um, sometimes it seems that things are getting better. You know, skeptics reason, you know, thought that there are conventions like, like the one here, and it seems like there's progress. Um, but at the same time, you know, I still turn on the TV and see suicide bombings. Um, do, you, do you think things are getting better or worse? I think the data overwhelmingly shows the world is more peaceful, more enlightened, more educated, less warlike, less disease-ridden, uh, less miserable than it has ever been in the course of human history. Dr. Steven Pinker has written a masterful book called The Better Angels of Our Nature, which I consider to be required reading for anybody who ever says the world is worse than it's ever been, which is the charge the church makes. They must tell us we're diseased so that they can sell us the cure. Oh, there's more murders, there's more suicides, there's more drug use, there's more despair. Well, there's a lot of really bad stuff, but if you look at us in the grand scheme of things, proportionally, we are now living in an age where we aren't as miserable as our ancestors were. I mean, do you really want to go back to times when there were white water fountains and colored water fountains, even in the last century? Uh, when you want to go to a point where women had no rights and could not vote and were seen as property, do you want to go back to pre-vaccine polio, really? You know, I... <laughs> The good old days were not really the good old days. Uh, it's a myth that we sold ourselves because we yearn for happier times. But the truth is, if we simply look, we see that today, despite its myriad of challenges, which we do have, is the best time ever. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that, will, that trend will continue. That's great. Yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's, a good, um, that's a very good outlook. Um, what really fascinated me is how people will take offense if you question. I, I bring up the example a lot. What happened early on in my time of deciding to question is someone would tell a story about the Bible, particularly the Noah's Ark story, and how the world was flooded and all the animals. And I would say, maybe that didn't happen exactly that way, or maybe it didn't happen, or whatever. And they would get angry and start threatening me and insulting me. Um, why do you think people take offense if they say, it, religious people, if you question their beliefs or some story, why do you think they get angry? You, you've experienced this, right? I think it's, a, it's because belief becomes so heavily interwoven with identity. If I have this belief that is a protected belief and I have it living inside these glass walls inside my heart, and you challenge that belief, you challenge a piece of my identity and uh, you make the world a scarier place. But when you're taught to be comfortable, when you're in an environment where comfort is king, the idea of, of the world being not guided by a divine hand is scary. The idea that the, the Bible might not be 100% true is frightening. You know, we, we live in, we live in a, a, a culture where comfort is king. People are comforted. They don't know anything about the Bible, but it comforts them. They don't know anything about the historicity of uh, the Christ story. They really don't know where that came from. They don't know who wrote the authors, who authored the Gospels. They don't uh, have any real knowledge of any stories in the Bible other than the basics. There was Adam and Eve, there was the Great Flood, there's Jesus on the cross, and Jesus is coming again. Thanks for playing. That's all they know. And it gives them comfort. And so if you make them uncomfortable, they shift and they squirm. And for some people, it causes them to flip out and you never see them again. And for other people, when they become uncomfortable, it provides a catalyst for them to begin an interesting journey of revelation, which is what happened for me. I was made uncomfortable by a speech I saw on the Internet by Christopher Hitchens. I was uncomfortable because I was a believer, yet he made sense. Mm -hmm. 
And that discomfort moved me out of my safe place into a place of discovery. But, you know, people are always going to, and they will attack the messenger. They will come after you personally and say, if you say, you know, how did, it, how did penguins walk 8,000 miles from here to board an ark in the desert? You're asking a, an innocuous question about whether or not the Noah story could be true. And they say, you're just evil. <laughs> well, the, they come after you because they, they can't challenge the validity of the story. And this is a common tactic, and I think it will always be a, a part of it. It will always happen. They'll always do the ad hominems. They'll always come after you when they can't defend the propositions. So. That's very interesting. It, it's also interesting that you brought up comfort. And um, obviously, when, when you start to question, and a, a, a lot of atheists get asked, you know, are you comfortable knowing this or not knowing this? But... I know that that's not relevant. Our, our comfort doesn't matter. We, we don't know something. We've got to find it out. But how do you deal with that? So we don't know how the world was created. We don't know if there's something or if it was just random. We don't know this. We don't know. How do you... Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not happy that I don't <laughs> yet understand the singularity that spun the, the universe into existence 13.7 billion years ago. I mean, I, I'm not okay with it. Like, I would like resolution. I would like to know the answers to... Questions both complex and simple. Uh, but I think there is an honesty in being able to say, I don't know, which is something that when you're in the faith, you often aren't ha given permission to do. Well, how does this happen? Well, you, it just did. I have faith. God told me. Well, if you are someone that's dealing truthfully or honestly with these issues, you have the liberation you have to be able to honestly say, I don't know. But you know what? Let's go try to find out. Let's do some digging. Let's read some books. Let's interview some people. Let's, let's do the homework. Let's dedicate ourselves to finding out more and knowing at least more tomorrow than we did today. But the words I don't know are a liberating thing to say, and they're an honest way to approach many of the things that we don't yet know. The difference is, is when there is a blank, we don't fill it with God. There's just a blank, and we hope to one day fill it. We're working to fill it, but we're not going to cheat with fantasy just because there is a blank space there. It just simply is the way it is. When people talk, like I'm sure you've studied the Bible a lot, and I, I've had to study the Bible since 2012 a lot. I've been you know, reading it, and maybe not front page one to page whatever, cause, but certain things. And I grew up as well in the Christian church. You know, I never knew about the slavery and the, all the bad things. You know, when people, I've heard many people throughout my life say, you know, I do the right thing because of the Bible. And, you know, obviously the Bible has a lot of bad things in it. Why do you think people attribute their positive moral actions to the Bible? I think they've been trained to do it. If you are indoctrinated with the idea that all goodness comes from the Bible, then when you do something good, you just deflect and say, well, it's because of the Bible. But here's a very telling thing. Find any of those people and say, what are the most important commandments ever given to humankind by God? And they will say almost unwaveringly, the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Wonderful. The most important ever given? Yes. By God to man. Yes. They're, ne they're necessary. We'll fall apart without them. Fine. Name them. Name the Ten Commandments. <laughs> There was a study done in a book, um, oh wow, I, I, I'm drawing a blank on the title of it. I, I used it in my Free OK 2011 speech and I've mentioned it since, uh, where they ask uh, citizens of the United States to name the Ten Commandments and 60% of the people surveyed couldn't name even half of them. Okay. Now if they're all that critical, why can't you tell me, you can tell me, you can name every lyric in uh, Katy Perry's latest single. You can sing the entire Gilligan's Island jingle. You can <laughs> recite childhood poems. You can remember all these other things that aren't the most important edicts ever given by God to man. But you can't tell me who wrote the Ten Commandments. And how hard are they? The first four commandments are wasted on God's vanity. The rest, how hard is that? Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't murder, whatever. Um, th there were commandments along these lines that predated the Christian culture and the Christian holy books. They're nothing original. You think it took a God to come up with be good to other people? And the Ten Commandments really aren't a great Ten Commandments. Where is do not rape in the Ten Commandments? It doesn't exist. No, God used that space for thou shalt have no other gods before me. Don't work on Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding me? 
So, you know, the idea that you need the Bible for goodness tells me, one, you're not, uh, you're not aware of where innate moral uh, goodness comes from, ethical actions come from, and two, you don't know your Bible. He's totally betrayed. You don't know the, your, your scriptures. You have no idea what's in the, at least the Old Testament's. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very good. Everything. Um, do you think a lot of religious people are well-intended? Yeah, I do. I think many of them are sincere. I think many of them are good people, which is something that in the atheist culture isn't said enough. Quite often we lead with, they're stupid, hmm. they're, they're uh, you know, whatever insult you want to throw at them. There are some people out there who make it difficult to say complimentary things, but the truth is there are some people out there, many people, religious people, who love their kids, who love their families, who love other people, who want a peaceful world, who work hard, who are going through the same stuff that we are. They just happen to have been brought up in a religious culture, and, and despite their religious belief, they are wonderful, beautiful people. That's great. And I, I actually, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of that. I mean, I think atheists are usually m more, you know, tolerant. You know, they, it's, I've had a positive experience where, you know, they, they usually do say that religious people are good people. It's just that, you know, uh, David S Silverman said they're just victims of indoctrination. Um, what about people who know a lot about science? You know, I like to use the example of a Ken Miller, uh, the professor. Uh, many examples of people who know a lot about science, know a lot about astronomy, biology, but they still go to church and believe in God. Any any thoughts on that? Well, you know, I've been reading, rereading Shermer's book, uh, Why People Believe Weird Things. And it talks about how that many of the more intelligent people are actually better at rationalizing the irrational. They are clever enough to be able. I call it the place in the mind where the weird shit lives. <laughs> and uh, you know, you've got all these rational compartments, and you have rational processes. But you know, we're all guilty of irrationality or capable of irrationality. If someone wants to believe, their desire to believe is greater than their desire to know. I mean, Miller himself will tell you that he doesn't agree with the Genesis accounts. Francis Collins will tell you he doesn't agree with the Genesis account of creation or human origin, and yet he still holds to the Bible. Now, that's just a patent irrationality or tap dance around a literal scripture. Well, then the Bible becomes more of a metaphor. So this is a retreat position away from the fundamentals of a fundamental faith. But, you know, intelligent people, they can be very clever at trying to explain the unexplainable. And uh, I think there is a host of factors at play. Uh, that's why it's, we should not step into the minefield of saying they're stupid. Uh, is there yeah, an they're probably smart. <laughs> is there an intelligence factor? Perhaps. Uh, Dr. Ryan Cragen down in Tampa has done some, some studies that indicate that people who are lifelong or long-term atheists may have, they may have a slightly, they might have an edge intellectually uh, over many religious people. But I, will, I, I wouldn't want to lead with that in a conversation anyway. <laughs> I think, you know, there are a host of reasons for beliefs as complex as the people themselves. And we have to approach each one, I think, sensitively and uh, in a way that hopefully changes minds. Uh, I, d I don't want someone to see me and I insult them and then expect that I'm going to lead them to better ideas. <laughs> I'd rather be more about dialogue in a compassionate way if possible. That's great. That's great. Um, my my next question is actually my favorite question to ask because this uh, obviously yesterday was the 14th anniversary of September 11th, and we we kind of covered a little of this before. But I I live in New Jersey, right near, so it was a local event for me. And the topic of Muslim suicide bombers wanting virgins in heaven became you know. That that became kind of a talking point for a couple of weeks after the attack, and I had my first friend who was an atheist. He he said, um, you know, these suicide bombers expecting virgins in heaven, they don't get a chance to be di disappointed. You know, obviously he, he's an atheist. He believes once you die, you're dead, and that's it. So they don't even have a chance to be disappointed. And the question that I love to ask is, does a part of you wish? <laughs> that they could be disappointed, whether that means whatever, there's a more reasonable afterlife or, you know, I had someone say once, you know, maybe when you die, there's like one or two minutes where, where you can figure everything out and know whether you were right or wrong. But does a part of you wish that they could be disappointed? 
Oh, I probably hold to that internet meme where <laughs> they show the 72 nuns all in their 70s standing for a photograph, and they say, here are your 72 virgins. <laughs> it's probably the, the, you know, the only way I might frame that. I, no, you know, I, I, um, I, I, my biggest regret isn't, has nothing to do with what they would encounter after they die. I think it would be more about uh, how they spent their lives while they lived. Um, which I consider to be a tragedy. The fact that they continued to believe that they would martyr themselves into this sort of post, uh, post-Earth superstardom and uh, just wreak such destruction on, on so many in the name of religion. It's, to me, that's just tragic. It's just tragic. And, you know, watching many, even atheists, in the wake of... Uh, 9-11, many people who have come up with these wild conspiracies about, well, who actually did it? And George W. Bush did it, blah, blah, blah. That's an example of otherwise intelligent people rationalizing themselves into positions that are really irrational, that don't speak to the evidence. I get email from people all the time that say, well, how can you be so skeptical about religion, but you don't know George W. Bush and Dick Cheney were behind 9-11? <laughs> and one of those buildings took a controlled demolition, Building 7, thermite, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, this is, this is irrationality in the wake of the evidence. And it's proof that atheism is no guarantee that you are rational. Does it matter that... I, I've heard some people, like, they'll say, well, Stalin was an atheist, or so-and-so. The, the popular people I hear, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot... Hitler, they'll say about Hitler. Yeah, that's and, wrong. And that Hitler, I think, is debatable. I don't know if he was religious, but... No, but it's the charge is made that Hitler yeah. was... Yeah, so Darwinist. Yeah. Does that even does that matter? All those bad. All those did things? they do what they did because they were atheists or because they were madmen? Um, who was it? It was a Dawkins who said, "Well, you know, Hitler had a mustache too. <laughs> does that mean that all people with mustaches?" I, I hope I attribute it to the right person. You want to double check me on that? I, I think I remember that um, too. Yeah. Those who get into Hitler, relatively. Uh, even in a shallow way, see that he invoked God in Mein Kampf. He was endorsed by the Catholic Church and, and believed he was doing the good work of God. But you, I don't think we borrow... I don't like to borrow Hitler as someone who represents the Christian Church, because he didn't. He doesn't represent most Christians. It's not a fair comparison. Is it important to know what motivated him? Yes. Did he invoke God? Yes. But... I don't use Hitler to paint all of mainstream Protestant Christians in the United States. It's a not a fair comparison. And yet many of them feel it's just fine to grab Stalin, who was an atheist, and the atrocities that he did and draw the link to us. Well, you know, we're just as quick to condemn Stalin as anybody else, Pol Pot and whatnot. Uh, it's more than anything else an attempt to align non-believers in God with the worst elements of human history. That's all it is. They throw the Hitler grenade, they throw the Stalin grenade because they are trying to ad hominem their way into a position of superiority. You're just like this evil person over here. Well, atrocities have been committed in the name and out of the name of religion throughout human history. So what? You know, it, it, let's look at the data. Let's look at the facts. Let's look at your historical text. Let's look at your holy book. Let's look at your doctrines. Let's look at your edicts. Let's look at the evidence, and let's start from there. And if you want to cherry pick, we can cherry pick all day, but we will get nowhere. That's great. No, that that's very interesting. Um, it's interesting you talked about the stereotypes that get kind of pushed in. What stereotypes about atheists do you want to confront and correct? Well, you know, the idea that we are without purpose, I hear that all the time. Well, if you have nothing to live for. Well, who said that? Bill O'Reilly, I think, alluded to it recently on the O'Reilly Factor. We're nihilists, we care only about ourselves, and we have no purpose, and nothing really matters. Well, what, what, where'd that come from? Of course, I don't believe in a deity. He doesn't believe I don't have purpose, or believe in people, or believe in love, or believe in and achieving dreams and maximizing every moment on this planet. It doesn't mean that I, I can't create purpose for myself and, uh, and just suck the marrow out of every moment on this planet. Okay. Uh, the idea that we have no purpose and care only about ourselves is crazy. Uh, I don't need an afterlife to love life. 
Uh, I'm not a sad person. That's another misnomer. Yeah, something that I always, they're sad. How can they have any joy? Well, uh, you should see my life. It's filled with goodness. It's just awesome. My life is happier now that I don't have to jam the square peg of religion into the round hole of reality. It's actually a relief. Yeah, a relief. <laughs> and, uh, and I've got community, and I've got people in my life who care about me and love me for who I am, and I don't have to make, uh, I don't have to make Christianity work against the facts anymore. I'm liberated. I'm breathing the free air. And uh, many people have talked to me about the sense of real peace and liberation they get. You know, yeah, it can be the world be a scarier place if there's not a happy heaven. Sometimes, sure. But it's also more gratifying to live a real life in the real world. That's great. That's great. I mean, that's, I'm kind of going through some of that, too. Um, what are the benefits? Like, should we maintain religious freedom and, and why? We should fight for the right of every individual to have and hold a, a personal religious belief. It's part of what makes us a free nation. Uh, I will fight for someone's right as a person, as an individual, to believe in a God. They do not, however, have a right to force me to believe in God or to vilify me or to put together some sort of a, a cultural, political, uh, relational, uh, professional consequence against me for not believing. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge about religion is that there is a great commission in almost all of them. Go ye into all the world. They want to connect. They want to replicate themselves. They want to take over. They want everyone to think like them. And so the nature of religion, unfortunately, isn't that someone harbors an individual belief that makes them warm and fuzzy. It usually translates into now go take a mission trip, now indoctrinate a bunch of kids, now go over here and threaten so-and-so with hell, now elect this religious congressperson so that they can legislate based on the Bible. <laughs> it's outward focused by design. But I focus, uh, I, I, I support the individual right to believe. Uh, you know, we all have that right, constitutionally protected right, and I will fight for it. That's great. Well, what's interesting, um, Tajikistan recently had an issue where, obviously, they're right next to Afghanistan. They're dealing with Islamic terrorism probably more than we are even with our situation. But they recently put in a law where you, um, they don't want Qurans being brought to schools. They don't want public displays of religion. And they don't want kids going to mosque until a certain age. I think it was 15 they don't want kids going to mosque. Now, in the framework of America, I think that that's wrong, but I think that, like, like, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, but I think that for them it might make sense, you know, with what they're dealing with. I just think um, a comparative religions class should be mandatory. Uh, I think, uh, it was a Matt Delahunty who once said, if you teach a child one religion, you indoctrinate them. If you teach them all religions, you inoculate them. You know, if, if someone only learns one religion and it's taught to them as the right one, then you've hamstrung them from the beginning. But if you teach them Christianity and Islam and you teach them the basic beliefs of Hinduism despite their thousands of gods, and if you get into you know, Scientology and Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness and all these other gods, well, you know, if you teach them at, not as truth, but here's who they are, here's who their deity is, here's what their belief system is, here's their holy book, here's their practice, here's the church, if you teach a child, I'm feeling a child's going to look around and say, hey, wait a minute, they're all doing an interpretive dance to the same kind of tune. And they're going to walk away thinking, this is, this is all, they're all of kind of the same ilk, they're all constructions of man. So I would like to see, my answer to the question would be, I'd like to see comparative religions objectively taught, in, even in elementary school. That's great. That's great. I mean, if it's someone's, obviously you and I, we didn't grow up as atheists, so we probably had, I don't want to say a first day, but like, like the, the question I'm going to get to is if it's someone's first day wondering what should they do. If, if someone is really early on. First day is a what? Like, for, like they, they've been going to church their whole life, and they always knew God was there, and today is their first day wondering, gee, is this really true, or what should they do? Should they read Give something? Give yourself permission to ask the questions and expect a reasonable answer. No worthy deity will punish you for being curious, for using the mind that he supposedly gave you. 
no worthy deity would punish you for expecting evidence. No worthy deity would punish you for, for being who you are. Uh, I hold to that absolutely. No worthy deity would ever say, it's like when Jesus had uh, read, been resurrected from the dead and he had appeared before the disciples. It was Judas, I was Judas, it was uh, Thomas, the Judas who betrayed. It was Thomas who said, hey, show me the nail holes and then I'll believe it's you, right? Well, Thomas was the one who got it right. Mm -hmm. Right? Everybody else was like, awesome, it's Jesus. And Thomas was the one who said, show me the evidence. And yet, when I was growing up, it was never Thomas that our parents told us to emulate. It was always Peter and Paul. You know, it was always John. We should be more like Thomas. It's okay to ask a question and expect a reasonable answer and keep asking until you get that answer. And if they tell you that it is forbidden to ask the question, make that the first question question you ask always. And if they say there's a person who you should never challenge or ask about, make that the first person you challenge or ask about because it tells you that they're trying to protect something that really shouldn't need protection. A worthy deity would say, bring it. Challenge me. Test me. I'll prove myself so overwhelmingly that you'll never have to ask again. And if he does not so, or it does not so, well, that probably tells you something about the merits of the deity you are asking about. That's great. That, that, that was a really awesome answer. Um, any thoughts on Madeline Marie O'Hare? Should, should people know about her? Or did you... Well, you know, she um, was probably the most famous face for the American atheist. Uh, she was vilified in her time. She was very abrasive, many times I think necessarily so, sometimes unnecessarily. But I find her story fascinating. She was horribly murdered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was uh, Arguably, possibly for what she believed. There's a, a, a kind of a big story behind her murder, her disappearance and murder. Just terrible stuff. But there can be no doubt that the groundwork and the hard work that she did in that time period, just putting herself out there, the most hated woman in America is what they called her. But she wouldn't allow believers to walk away from the conversation. She said, no, you are going to have to prove this. Mm -hmm. you know, the burden of the proof is on the person making the claim. By the way, you're the one making the claim. So prove it or get out. And, you know, she, there can be no denying that she made, while she made a lot of enemies, she also made a significant contribution. And a very difficult time for women. Mm -hmm. Very difficult time Absolutely. for a woman's voice to be heard. So, and I always lean back to that. You know, was her style my style? Not really. <laughs> but she, she did it. She put herself It's out. hard to be the first one, you know. The one. first one through the wall always gets bloody, right? Uh, she, in many instances, was the one person who sort of helped pave the way for many of the rest of us. That's great. Yeah, that's, that's great. Have you ever thought that maybe there, maybe, the question is, have you ever thought that what you're doing now is actually God's plan for you? Maybe there's a God that really believes as you and kind of your your community believes and maybe God wants us to question and not form these groups like I mean ha have you ever thought maybe that this is God plan God's plan for you <laughs> no. I had somebody tell me that you're exactly where God wants you until the point when he does reveal himself and you reverse your position um, you know what kind of a deity would want me to essentially say there's no evidence he exists so just well, maybe they would like that you didn't assume someone else is... Maybe they would like that you're looking as opposed to... You know what I mean? Like, maybe they would like... Well, then he's still a passive deity. Yeah. No benevolent deity would say, I love the skepticism over here. I'm going to remain invisible over here <laughs> behind this cosmic rock and allow them to all do battle. I mean, a benevolent deity would have parted the curtain of the sky long ago and mm -hmm. solved this mystery. So even if there was a deity who thought, hey, I think it's awesome that Seth is a skeptic, if he didn't care enough to tap everybody on the shoulder and solve the question for seven billion inhabitants and their descendants and their ancestors, uh, I want uh, nothing to do with them. I, I have no use for them, you know? Oh, that's great. Uh, you know, I, I, I really appreciate your, your time. Um, I usually end asking, uh, did you have any questions for me? Or any statement you want to make? Or I think like more than anything else, I would, I would encourage anybody who's going through a moment in their life when they have questions that 
religion is very good at killing curiosity, especially in kids. And I think curiosity is just, if, if you can live a curious life, you know, if you can wake up every day and say, I'm going to make today a discovery. I'm going to, I want my kids to go out and learn some stuff I didn't know and come back and tell me about it. Uh, I want to give myself permission to change my mind when I get it wrong. I'm going to put myself out there to be corrected when I make a mistake. I'm going to do my best to live an honest life, no matter what that means. There is a liberation and comfort and joy that comes with that that is beyond description. And it's harder for some than others, depending on where you live. But if possible, live an openly curious life of, of, of evidence-based discovery. And I think you will have maximize as best you can your footprint upon this earth. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrews. My pleasure.